Muy buenas noches, bienvenidos a la segunda jornada del Festival de Cine Latinoamericano de Grand Rapids. Welcome to the Grand Rapids Latin American Film Festival. This is our second night of the festival, which uh, this year is going to be fully online. And uh, tonight we are showcasing the film Canción Sin Nombre, Song Without a Name, by director uh, Melina León, who is joining us from Peru to talk about her film. So please join us, um, ask your questions via Facebook or YouTube and Melina will be more than happy to, to answer it. Melina <clears throat> grew up in Lima and moved to New York City in 2003 to study film directing at Columbia University where she graduated with an MFA. Her short film, El Paraíso de Lili, Lili's Paradise, made its international debut in 2009 at the prestigious 47th New York Film Festival. The film won 11 awards uh, during the, its 20 plus festival run, including Best Latin American Film at Sao Paulo International Short Film Festival. Canción Sin Nombre, Song Without Name, is her first feature film. Melina, bienvenida, un placer tenerte con nosotros. Welcome. Thank you very much, Medar. Um, yeah, this is your debut film. Let me tell you how, you know, I, I was so impressed the first time that I saw this film and I saw it again today and I'm still moved by um, the work that you've done you know, to, to be able to tell such a powerful, uh, painful story and, and yet in a visually compelling way. Um, I read a direct uh, a, a critic who said that it is um, the most beautiful of bad dreams, and I mm -hmm. think it's the best way to describe it. So, I wanted to ask you about um, how you came up with this story. I know it's based on on true events, uh, but how how did you put it together? 
Thank you for reminding me that beautiful phrase by Guy Lodge from Variety. Mm -hmm. he, was, he's, he was very inspired, I think, when he wrote that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, well, um, yeah, I think it is a memory. It's and it's an effort to to go back into that memory and honor what is what was a dream, our dreams in the eighties, growing mm -hmm. up back then in Peru, and also honoring the the basic truth that it was a nightmare as well mm -hmm. so i guess that's my way to put it to explain why he wrote that and why i think it's, it's such a great way to describe it because um yeah he has all those aspects and he has all those uh like oppositions uh ideas that may seem opposed but mm -hmm. Um, actually, are part of the one same thing, one same experience. Um, yeah. So. So, um, mm -hmm. so your father. The film is dedicated to your father, who is a journalist, and I understand that um, he wrote. He was the person who uncovered this um, traffic, this child case. trafficking. Yes. 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 Um, yeah, when I was studying in New York, I was looking for ideas for my first film, and um, by chance he called me to just uh, chat, but he had a story to share. He he said, you're not going to believe, I just got a phone call uh, from a friend from France, and it was this French lady that uh, happens to be one of the kids that got stolen in mm -hmm. one. So that was so crazy for me because this phone call was on around 2006. So, so many years later, uh, decades later, uh, it felt like uh, a movie. Mm -hmm. right? uh, it had that quality um, of miraculous moment. And uh, yeah, so he had, when he was a journalist in La Republica newspaper, uh, this was the first case that they, they, the first first headline. So they made an investigation about this child trafficking that was taking place, um, and then, yeah, they were able to, like in the film, they were able to, to find the, the mafia, but you know. You know what happens later in the film. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so I, in a way, it's like me retelling the news, but it, it's my version of the story, right? It's, right. That's right. Like, I'm yeah. reading a comment um, here. We received a comment from one of our viewers who says, Thank you for the moving and powerful film. Um, can you tell us more about the children who were stolen from their parents? Was this similar to what occurred in Argentina during the dirty wars? If different, how so? Thank you. Mm -hmm. More about the who, yeah. Well, I, I got to meet one of them, uh, Celine Gido. Um, and um, actually I only met her on, on the phone. She lives in France. She's the woman that called my father. Um, and I know the case of two other siblings uh, that live in France and um, managed to come back as well. But these are like three people from hundreds, hundreds that never came back. So it's similar, of course. The, the procedures are similar to what happened in Argentina during their dictatorship and what happens what happens everywhere in the world actually is not a thing of the past. It's important, I think, to remember mm -hmm. that the trafficking of people is is nowadays uh, perhaps one of the most important illegal businesses in the world, um, even more than drug dealing. So, so yeah, it's it's important to remember that it's not in the past. It's right, still happening. 
-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Everywhere um, in the world. Okay, we have another question here. Jasmine Kuyaki, bro. Uh, she says, Hola, Melina. Soy de Perú y vivo en Grand Rapids. Primero Hola. que nada, felicitarte por la exquisita pieza artística que has creado. Quisiera yeah. preguntarte cómo fue el proceso de creación de este proyecto. Let me translate that for our viewers who do not speak Spanish. She's saying, she's uh, uh, congratulating Melina for, for her work. And she's asking, how was the creative process? How did she create this project? Well, it's, I think it's a very long process, uh, Jasmine. Very long process that perhaps even goes back to my childhood days watching films on VHS tapes and uh, making my own tapes, recording, fascinated with, I didn't have a camera, but I did have Betamax and VHS recorders. So I was like taping, you know, parts of, recording parts of the shows and then mixing them up, a little bit of editing. Um, perhaps it goes that far and assisting going to see theater we have a very incredible group uh called in quechua in native language Jujetskani, which means i'm thinking and i'm lucky that they have their house their theater in my neighborhood mm -hmm. so and also they i got to to be close to them because of a number of reasons so when i was little, very little so that i think influenced me a lot and in a way, I think it goes back to that, the creative process to do this film. Um, apart from that, we, we can jump to that phone call, to that mysterious phone call and, uh, and me thinking, oh my God, there is a movie here. It has all the elements. It, is, it has some quality that seems to be like for a movie, it's like that beard and life aspect of it. Also, it comes from reality and it speaks about social justice or the lack of social justice. Uh, so it has the political elements, the social elements. And so it was a matter of like, I guess in all films, calling the right people to join you in this nightmare or dream, nightmare dream, as Guy Lash says, uh, the most beautiful of bad dreams <laughs> uh, <laughs> that sometimes it, it's the film uh, but it's also the making of the film no? because uh, so many things uh, turn out to be well we the film has been very well received but you know it, it's been it took many years and um, it, it has uh, tremendous difficulties so well it was all worth uh, the, the labor. Uh, Chris, Krista is asking, why did you decide to film in black and white? Sure, Krista. Um, well, in those days, the newspapers were printed uh, only in black and white. So I thought, in a way, it's my version of the story, the version of the story that my father told but there is a link there there is something that unites uh, our storytelling and uh i thought this could be this decision this this could honor this fact that uh, our memory of those days it's in black and white the photographs of those days that i was watching as a kid i was looking at all those photographs of peasants that were murdered or just, um, you know, terrible things photographed in, in black and white. Um, also, you know, that's the most, um, I guess, uh, um, important reason, but there is also practical reasons. Our budget was very tight and um, we wanted to be sort of accurate in our recreation of the settings and we thought it's it's much uh less um as much uh, more more it would be more accurate if we don't choose colors 
there's more chances, sorry. There's more chances to make mistakes if we do in color, if we do it in color than if we go in black and white. That that also goes. Uh, and also the beauty of, of the black and white photography for sure. Black and white, and I also noticed that the aspect ratio was like uh, that of a TV set, right? It's, it was more square rather than widescreen. So it gives that yeah. feel of, uh, of something of the past, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Again, it's the same case. There's not one reason, but you know, that, that one, I, I, I think that was the most important one, that, the fact that uh, the 4x3 is the format of the TVs in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And again, the TVs is, is the way we were learning the news, right? So again, it's, it brings you to the 80s, right? the, the format. Um, oh, but, but there's also other reasons. I, I thought mm -hmm. since the protagonist is a humble person, it's it's smart to use a humble format. I think it's humble to to talking squares, uh -huh. as opposed to big cinemascope. Excellent. Um, I was um, I was thinking also about uh, the the characters and and the actors and actresses that that uh, you depict in the film. Um, so who, who what can you tell us about them? the community that you are portraying in this film? Yeah, well, it's act amateur actors um, that I went to, um, that I found in a long process of casting and uh, I went to meet them in their neighborhoods. I didn't do the opposite as big productions usually do. They do casting in like, you know, sort of like middle class uh, neighborhoods and then you're <laughs> supposed to go there. But I thought this is ridiculous. I want to find, uh, to make it easier for a person that lives in the outskirts of Lima in the less privileged places to be able to participate. So obviously, and it's gonna be more authentic. So obviously I have to go there and and uh, do, do it there. So I there is a big neighborhood in Lima called Villa El Salvador that um, actually uh, the neighborhood that we're portraying in the film, it's, it's speaking about that place. Um, we just call it Villa in the film. Um, and there it was run by very progressive people for a number of years that in spite of the poverty and all, um, took care of the arts. So there's a lot of small theaters in that neighborhood. So I just found one that I thought had more resources and where I was gonna be able to do by casting, like the biggest part, because I went to most of them, but I wanted to have like a base. So I just went there, introduced myself, and they, of course, were super nice and allowed me, and, and, and they thought it was, of course, it made sense. Uh, it was going to be easier for everyone to participate. And yeah, I, I, I was going there for many, many months, and I started to find the, 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 the cast. So are they professional actors, or are they people from no. the community? No, just be amateur actors that just wanted to to give it a shot, <laughs> like that. Okay, we have another question. Uh, this one is coming from Brian Deyo. And Brian says, I found the relationship between the journalist and the actor to be beautiful, sad, and very moving. Can you comment on how or why you decided to weave this story with the story of the mothers who lost their children? Sure, Brian, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I don't like forgetting that the LGBTQ plus uh, aspect of the film. Um, why did I decide that? Because I guess when I was writing the film, I felt that something was happening when one version of the script, in many versions of the script actually, Pedro was not gay and I felt like uh, somehow he was becoming a hero 
a sort of mm. middle class, sort of white uh, male uh, hero. And I thought that is that was not what I the, the right way that I was gonna repeat some stereotype if I had made a mistake. I, I thought um, that it's more interesting if all the characters share um, an, a certain oppression and we learn that somehow um, this violence perpetrated against women and against even more to indigenous women it's one sort of horrible violence, but it's not the only one. So I wanted to open it up and and say this is in every, in every level of society. So Excellent. I, I, yeah. So the, the two characters, although they appear to be so different at first sight, they share the, the, the fact that they belong to oppressed communities, right? To oppressed people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your film depicts difficult um, political and social issues in Peru, um, things related to the, the, the struggle of the indigenous people in Peruvian society, the, the, the um, trafficking of uh, children, um, the violence of the state against um, uh, uh, peoples and, and also the violence of groups like uh, Sendero Luminoso. So, are you concerned about how uh, some sectors of uh, Peruvian society is going to respond to the film, or are you welcoming or looking forward to having those conversations? Well, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I don't worry too much about. Uh, if we're gonna be annoying and um, getting criticized uh, from members of society, like um, I guess if that happens, it's gonna be more interesting because it means like we're moving something. Um, but we just want to premiere the film at some point. It's like we were so ready to premiere the film in April. And we couldn't, uh, and now it's like, well, we have premiered in Lima, but it's in the Festival of Lima, right? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to hit theaters and finally have that moment to confront uh, Peruvians, uh, uh, you know, the ones that were not lucky to, to attend to the festival. So, yeah, I, I at this point, I really just want to premiere the film. I don't know how we're going to do it because still things are still bad here, but um yeah i think it will actually be better if if we annoy some people and uh, <laughs> that always helps like to generate debate um and to to to, be, to make people aware of the film to of the themes behind the film and um and to make people realize that this um a structure or actors in society that want to preserve the status quo, uh, they, they are alive. Mm, pretty much willing to give a fight for us to go backwards instead of progress. We have another question uh, coming from Krista. She asks, why did you decide to have a Cuban character? Why ah, is well, this actor Cuba. Cuban? Yes. Yeah, well, it's a little homage to a Cuban friend who who was living in Peru, um, not in the 80s, he arrived later, but anyway, I wanted him to be there, and it, to me, it was, it's a little bit of a sig signaling, a little bit, remembering a little bit of the oppression that um, gay people suffered in Cuba. Uh, I'm not sure anymore if that remains the same if, he, if it's free now, if it's just better, like in Peru, it's not great at all, but it's a bit better than in the 80s, we have to say. Um, but I wanted that, uh, to remember that, uh, 
because of because he, this friend of mine did suffer that and it was one of the reasons he he was he wasn't there anymore um and also because i wanted uh, to have a foreigner in the film mm. and i wanted that foreigner to to give some life some joy to the film i as i was writing the film the film is so sad i was like being sad myself and just struggling to write every word and i thought i i, I don't think life is like this i think life has in the even in the worst moments has um joy and i thought let's give it to this foreigner to give a spice <laughs> great we have another question uh this one is coming from erin sanasio sanisio and she writes i read a review in the new york times about the film which commented National tragedies don't explode. They linger in the air like a poisoned fog that won't lift. I love how subtle your film was rather than explosive. You made me uh, feel the tragedy through blurriness, dark scenes of Georgina walking, and even feeling a sense of evil just by looking at locked doors of the eerie spotted floor in the clinic. Can you comment on this decision to have some restraint with ex with explicitly showing uh, how does it go? Let me see. The, how does it end? I, I can't find the ending of the question. Can you comment on this decision to have some restraint with X? Oh, it's it must be without explicit explicitly showing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's how it ends the question. Okay. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you for uh, that's another beautiful quote we got from New York Times. Thanks so much, Erin, for for bringing that one up. Um, yeah, I, I love how she, the writer, I think her name is Theo, um, talked about the fog and how in my version of the film versus the version of my father's uh, in the news. Uh, the tragedy remains, and I really appreciate that comment of saying that. Uh, yeah, there's even though there's an explosion in the film, the, the film is not about that. It's more about uh, con it's more condensed or mysterious, I guess. Restraint, restraint. Um, I think that was that is. Um, Somehow, at some point, both the DP and I learned to see the world in a very Japanese way, <laughs> because Peru is the is the second um, the second uh, place where there's more Japanese descendants in South America. The first is Brazil. And as you can see, the music was made by uh, Nikki, a uh, Japanese descendant. She's Peruvian, Japanese. And I think we, the, the first person that, my first boss uh, in the film industry was uh, another Japanese Peruvian person, a poet that really influ influenced me, influenced me. Um, he really was searching for that attitude in his poems, the attitude of restraint. Um, and I think uh, somehow, because he, he was um, not a boss, of course, I, I would see him more like a master, but he hated that title. He used to hate that title, but uh, uh, Jose Watanabe, no? Um, so I think it's, it's an interesting attitude because it speaks a bit about, um, a certain stoic, stoic, stoicism and, um, trying to see more and 
remain somehow, I think there's some dignity in it and remain um, like a tree <laughs> in the worst moments. The earth is trembling, but you are like a tree because you stay quiet you know, and calm and observe. And that doesn't mean that you are not fighting against what is in unjust, but uh, you're not making it worse, I think, with, with this restraint. Mm. Okay, we, one, we have one last question uh, because we are running out of time and this came uh, comes from Jasmine Kuyaiki Bro again. Uh, she says, Qué interesante que Yuyachkani te haya influenciado y que tu proceso de creación se remonte a tu niñez. ¿Podrías compartir con nosotros cómo fue la escritura del guión y qué dificultades encontraste en el proceso de realizarlo? So she's asking about the writing of, of the script and, and, uh, and bringing it to life in the film. Uh, thank you, Jasmine. Um, I wrote a film, I co-wrote this film with Michael White, a guy from St. Louis, who was studying with me in Colombia. And um, he's a very good friend and became eventually a producer of the film too. Um, and we wrote for many years uh, after work, after I was working as an editor, doing whatnot, I, I worked doing everything in New York. Um, and he was uh, working as an English professor around the world, like in Poland, Korea, traveling to many places, but we found some time some, to, to get together and just share pages. In the very beginning, we were working in English and he was writing and I was giving notes. And then as we were getting a bit closer uh, to my big move, to Peru, we we decided it is smarter to write the film in Spanish. So because he doesn't speak Spanish, I I was taking the the lead and writing, and he was giving comments of my when you know I was translating, and then he will he will give notes. More or less, that was the the process, and it was a very long one. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we ran out of time. Um, thank you again, Melina, for taking the time to be with us oh. today. Yes? I think there is one more. There is one more? Oh, yes. what is it? My daughter, she, Sally. I think Sally. Oh, yes, Sally is... Coriatis. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Sally mm -hmm. says, my daughter is currently studying at Columbia to receive her master's in film. I'm so inspired to see an alumni who uh, produced such a beautiful film. What advice would you give to these student filmmakers? Thank you, Sally, for that question. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Sally. Um, what advice? That's a tough question. I guess just uh, be happy in the middle of the storm, you know, <laughs> just that. I, I, I don't have much more wisdom to share, except that it's tough. It's very tough to to have the patience to put together such budgets uh, to to make your you know your vision to your story uh, and to all. so I think in the middle you have to enjoy and all these experiences that you have will make you eventually uh, will make you make a better film in the end. Like if I hadn't had the experience of being a native Spanish speaker living in New York in the middle of all these people talking about blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I thought I, 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 I could speak English. That experience helped me to understand all the Quechua people, all the indigenous people in Lima trying to speak in Spanish with everyone here, blah, 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 going blah, blah, blah. And they feeling like left behind because their native language is Quechua. So only because I went through this hardship, I was able to connect better. And this is just one little example, but all these things you go through in life as you make your projects enrich you. And I think that, you know, to absorb all that, 
and sometimes you'll use you'll use it. Sometimes your your daughter will use it. I think. Thank you, thank you again, Melina, uh, for being with us today and uh, for sh sharing your your work and 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 your words with uh, with us. And I really hope that the time will come soon that everyone will be able to see your film in a big screen the way it should be seen um, and, and that we get the opportunity to have you here in person maybe for your next film okay so thank you again i hope so we finally made it yes. thank you so much for your patience and your encouragement thank you and and to all of you uh who joined us from your homes uh, please come join us again tomorrow. We're going to have um, the film La Camarista, The Chambermaid, which will be released this Saturday, September, September 18th at 8 p.m. Uh, see you then. Bye.